So I'd like to welcome everybody to episode four of Awakening Beyond Thought, an online interactive journey out of the blah, blah, blah of everyday life and into the simple strength of stillness. This is hosted by Gary Weber and Richard Doyle. We're very excited for all of you who can be here live, and we're also excited for everybody who's joining us via the recording from all around the world. So welcome. Very briefly, I'm going to introduce the two hosts, and then we'll get right into it with questions kind of flowing throughout. So just send them to me as you have them, and we'll get them in. Uh, professor Richard Doyle, aka Mobius, is a liberal arts research professor at Penn State University, where he's taught since 1994. He's the author of several books, uh, Darwin's Pharmacy, Sex, Plants, and the Evolution of the Newosphere is his most recent, and it focuses on the co-evolution co of humans with psychedelic plants such as psilocybin, cannabis, and ayahuasca. Uh, Rich has also co-hosted two other shows for us, one exploring the soul of nature and another Radio Free Vallis, which we're excited to announce today is going to be returning, so look out for that. Um, and. Yeah, so his co-host, Gary Weber, has done over 30,000 hours of meditation and yoga with various teachers in various disciplines and countries. He has also written several books, Happiness Beyond Thought, A Practical Guide to Awakening, and Dancing Beyond Thought, The Bhagavad Gita Verses and Dialogues for Awakening uh, are some of his more recent ones. And we're so thrilled to have both of them here for episode four of this continuing journey exploring non-dual reality. So without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to Rich and Gary. And? Uh, yeah, I, am, I unmuted you. I Sorry, you're good now. We're good? You can hear us? Yeah, we can hear you loud and clear. Can sorry. About that. Can you hear me now? <laughs> so uh, just as a reminder, uh, you know, when we, when we made the little teaser video, it was a uh, based on our experience last time that we felt that, um, you know, when we get questions, that questions are really the, the yumminess of uh, the, the webinar. And that, you know, just as a reminder that there are at least, you know, two different kinds of questions. There's a question that is looking for some bit of data or information as a, as a kind of answer. And there are questions that are really kind of beyond thought that are um, really a mode of engagement with this stillness that we're trying to uh, summon here collectively. So um, basically, Gary and I are all ears and uh, ready to respond uh, collectively and individually to the questions that get us to stillness. Mm. Would you like to start with one right away? Absolutely. OK, cool. I have a question from Jake who writes, uh, here's a question for Rich and Gary, just wondering how to tell if one is flip-flopping practices too much. Where's the line between experimentation to see what works and escaping one's experience? Thanks. Hi, Jake. Um, you, you get a feel for it. I mean, if, if you're changing your question five times a day, that's too much. Uh, I, I say in happiness beyond thought, uh, stick with the question for about a month. I mean, one of the ego's favorite defenses is to create this storyline about how, you know, you just don't have the right question. That's what's the problem here. We need another question, which makes sure you change direction often enough that nothing really serious happens. So it becomes a feeling of whether or not you think the question is working over a couple days basis. You can't make a decision based on whether it's changed in the last hour. But try to watch yourself over a couple days and see if, in fact, you are making progress you won't be able to determine exactly because most of the progress takes place offline, which we have no way to track. So just keep asking the question, stick with it for a month if you can, and see how you do after a month. Much shorter than that, and you really are in danger getting into window shopping. And then nothing really happens. Yeah, I would, uh, I would emphasize and reiterate uh, what Gary was saying about the feeling that um, you know, if you're asking the question about flip-flopping, um, clearly at least two things are happening. One is you're pursuing a question or a practice, and then you're shifting. And as a result of the shifting, you get a feeling such as, should I have done that? Am I doing that? Am I avoiding something? And the fact that you're getting that feeling 
means you can also get the feeling of how does this question feel compared to this question? Uh, in, in my experience, the, uh, the content of the questions are less important than the ability to focus on what the questions do to us, right? And so even if what they do to us is make us change the question, focusing on that feeling that you're having when you're asking, am I changing the question too much? Is almost your question, <laughs> if you will, right? You know, um, like, and, and so maybe just by asking the question, what is my question? Um, might solve that flip-flopping, but I agree entirely with Gary. I can, I can, you know, I, I, I have observed both in myself and others the way in which one can really get into this kind of window shopping, you know, kind of, salad bar approach. It's like, well, maybe I'll try a little bit of this now, you know, maybe I'll try some of the garbanzo beans or the marshmallow salad. And really then you're just being the kind of uh, um, self-inquiry consumer and you're not really, you know, kind of boring down into the self there. But, you know, Jake, you know, you know how to feel that out. Yeah. It's really key. Yeah. It, yeah. Okay. As, yeah. as Rich pointed out, uh, I did this mostly DIY. And so what, what you have to do is kind of get a, as Rich was saying, get a feel for how things are working with you because you're, going, you're the best indicator anybody could ever have of your own state of mind. Nobody else can gauge it as well as you can. And if you can feel how practices are working for you, you know, as Rich was saying, feel them when they're there, feel them when they're not there, feel them as you try to change them, get a real tactile sense for how things are happening inside your consciousness. I mean, the, the right question will feel differently from, oh, just another question. You'll have to get that sense because as you go forward, you're going to be sometimes in uncharted territory and your own tactile perceptions are what's really going to guide you which direction you should go. But you've got to develop that sense, that feel for what's working, what's not working. They do feel different if they're doing something good or making a difference than if they aren't making a difference. You can really get a handle on that. But get out of your head. As Rich was saying, get into the feel of the thing, because the feel is really where the action is. And Jake, one, one more thing is that sometimes uh, when I share with people and tell them, oh, you know, try to feel your way to it, because that's the way it feels to me. Sometimes it, it doesn't seem that they can feel it or that they know what I'm talking about. And inevitably, what that means is, is that they're not getting still enough when they're asking the question. Right. It's 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 not just the question, of course, as you well know, it's asking the question and then really tasting the result to use a slightly different. You know, when you're cooking soup, I cooked some soup yesterday. You have to keep tasting it. And so if you're, you know, putting a lot of other flavors in your mouth, you're not going to be able to taste that soup. So if you can really get still with the question. And then feel just how that question, almost like each question is a different poem. What does that poem do with me? Then you can start to feel like which one? Oh, yeah, I feel that one. Okay, when am I? Okay, I can't get around that one so easily, right? Whereas maybe I can um, really kind of explain away where am I or who am I? Um, but as Gary was saying, that's really you, you know? Tuning your own responsiveness to those questions will tell you the answer to, you know, which one is giving the best effect. Yeah, we've talked before about Byron Katie's method it's called the work. There's a whole, tons of YouTube videos about her with her from her. And the idea is you ask one question, is this problem, this memory, this story I have running right now, is it true? Can I be certain that it's true? Then you get into the next two questions, which are, how does it feel when I have this question in my consciousness, this problem, this anxiety, this fear? You can just feel your way into that and then say, how does, next question is, how would it feel if I didn't have that feeling? And you can use that on current problems that you've got to work with this, what we're just talking about this, you know, yes, it's there, no, it's not there. Oh, here it is, and I have it in consciousness. You can invoke it, feel it. And then go to the you don't have it and just feel how different those feel to begin conditioning yourself to recognize when you're on track, 
or not on track, whether the soup tastes good or the soup doesn't taste good. Great, thank you guys. Um, questions coming in, so I'm just going to uh, go with the next one. Um, Fareed asks, is the quiet stillness the same if you achieve it through spiritual means and some hallucinogens? Is one better and the differences? So I guess via spiritual means versus hallucinogenic means. Uh, great question, Fareed. Um, all I can do is, you know, respond with my own experience. Um, and with, you know, the experience is the same, it, it seems to me. The quieting of thought that um, I experienced after a particular ayahuasca ceremony was, you know, this kind of incredible awakening into this sense that something was missing. <laughs> Like, what is it? You know, I, I didn't quite know because I hadn't heard of this idea of being beyond thought. I knew that something was unbelievably different and beautiful and crystalline, almost I would use, would be the uh, phrasing, and sacred. Um, and that what that seems to have done was to let me know that such a state was possible. And once that state was possible, it seems like my brain saw that that state was possible and began in training the rest of Mobius to get back to that state and integrate that state. So one of the differences, it seems to me, in my own experience is that we say, oh, the ayahuasca caused that state, and now I am no longer on ayahuasca. And maybe I can still have a kind of rapport or experience of the ongoing state, but at times it can seem as if it is separate from my ordinary state. It's somehow distinct from my ordinary state. But what all the practices I did, you know, both before but also after experiencing that state seems to have done is to help me work to a place where I can integrate it so that it is there, that crystalline state is there to be had at all times. So a friend of mine compared it to the difference between taking a cab somewhere and walking somewhere, right? If you walk somewhere, you can find your way back. So I wouldn't say that one is better or worse. You know, I think if we use the kind of language of the Buddhist tradition, psychedelics are skillful means. They're ways of transmitting to us that this state of Buddha nature or the state of stillness is. But in terms of being able to integrate it and have an ongoing abiding in this state, then it seems to me that um, practices besides psychedelics are also called for. Now, in the shamanic traditions in which many of the things that we call psychedelics are used, it would seem to be the case that other practices are used in order to abide that state. Um, so I wouldn't say that one is better than the other, but I would say that um, psychedelics are neither necessary nor sufficient to awakening, but they are extraordinary tools for awakening. Yeah, from the non-experiential side and the scientific side, uh, since I have no experience in psychedelics, direct experience, uh, it, it's, we, we now know pretty clearly that uh, magic mushroom, psilocybin, that ingredient, produce exactly the same phenomena as near as you can subjectively record it uh, between non-dual awakening and uh, psilocybin. Uh, we've got good confirmation of the same parts of the brain are shut down in the same way. Uh, the same phenomena appear to manifest. They describe them in the same terms. There's one mysticism scale that the people use to describe both sets of experiences is they're the same words that they use to describe. So there's a lot of uh, apparent third person subjective commonality between those. Something to remember too, and what really ties in what Rich was talking about is um, psychedelics are a way to produce something to show you what your brain can do. But you can, your brain can do it because the psychedelics have just come in and hijacked the 
chemical delivery systems in your body. They find other ways to substitute and work into those systems. But all the receptors are already there. We've got dopaminergic receptors. We've got cannabinoid receptors. We've got opiate receptors. They already exist. So as Rich was saying, you know, the walking part is to learn how to give the brain time to find out how to manufacture these chemicals, apply them in the same way to produce the same experiences. If you give it enough examples, it can walk through this process and do it all by itself. But if you keep coming in with exogenous uh, chemicals, you're going to have a hard time the brain ever finding its own, you'd be able to walk its way through something. You can show it, but it's more like that's the cab. But as far as you know, finding a way to do it yourself and have the body do it itself, it can do it. It just needs time to figure out how to make that, make that walk take place. Thank you. Thank you for those answers. And thank you, Fareed. Uh, he remarks, Fareed remarks, so the effort is useless. If I can just take the psych psychedelic and get to the same place in shorter form and then, then make the effort spiritually to maintain it. Well, I think, Fareed, they're saying you can get there, but to stay there and maybe really to experience it, it seems maybe uh, try both. Uh, well, you've heard the answer, so. Well, I mean, I, I don't mean to interrupt, but I, I, yeah. I would say that that psychedelics are a spiritual effort <laughs> um that that uh it, it is a practice um you know a lot of times in the uh, 60s you know the people would say oh you know like jack kerouac in fact you know said to his friends he's like oh you can't just get to you know heaven by eating some mushrooms which is exactly what they were uh talking about but acting like that was somehow easy or simple and anyone who's ever actually participated in a kind of deep psychedelic egodelic experience knows that it's it's a joy but it's it's also it's also work you're also going through something it's a process so uh i, I really would say that you know psychedelics are a legitimate uh practice and that you know for you're right in the sense that effort is useless in the sense that if there's somebody there doing it then you know it's not going to be all that helpful but just as with psychedelics seem to come into our lives uh if we need them then these practices also come into our lives and the more we surrender to the way the cosmos is attempting to teach us which is where i would put the category of both psychedelics and the non-dual practices that we're talking about the more we're going to achieve that state because the state is the practice of surrender and so some of you may have read on blog posts or heard in some of my videos, or even our videos, that uh, I was down in Yucatan in 12, 12, 12 for the end of the earth, where it was going to happen. A Mexican billionaire invited six or eight of us down to come and talk about our practices and go through you know, what we had done and what they would achieve. And one of the fellows there, Rich knows the guy as well, uh, had done 2,000 uh, hits of high strength acid. 2,000. And he was really this no place. I mean, his idea was to take the acid and to have ego death and, you know, not come back again and be completely in the non-dual state. Well, he'd done it 2,000 times, and he was still, uh, at the very least, in the same place. And what turns out he had done, in my humble opinion, I maybe Rich too, Rich can share on this, is that he had an enormous ego now because he became an extreme acid athlete. He was really a wunderkin. He had uh, talk shows, he had videos, he had books written about this 2000 experiences on acid, but he was really in the same or even a worse place non-dually than he had been before he started this long journey. Yeah, it's a, it's a phenomenon that's not unlike, um, it can happen, uh, you know, to after one engages in sort of extraordinarily rigorous meditation is that the meditation, uh, you know, allows us to experience different states and we achieve insights, but then it also becomes possible that we become kind of, you know, proud or puffed up about our meditation. And so uh, the work of journeying beyond thought or journeying to no self is kind of impaired by that process. So so I would, you know, just encourage for it, for you to get still and to really surrender to where you're trying to get 
with psychedelics and with non-dual practice. And the more you surrender, the more the cosmos will provide those um, uh, teachings for you in whatever form they need to come at the moment that they need to come. Yeah, just one other point. I'm one fellow I've been working with, and I shared this uh, with Rich, with the guy's uh, concurrence, is that he had been practicing incredibly uh, diligently, six, seven, eight hours a day for six months, uh, practice, practice, practice. We had met and talked at a conference, and he was really actively going after this thing. And he said, what should I do? Should I do some, some mushrooms? I said, sure, do some mushrooms. And he did once, and it just completely changed everything. I mean, he basically dropped from being a doer doing a meditation practice to where he saw with the mushrooms, in fact, what it was supposed to look like, and now that's what he has. I mean, it just took that little click to show him what it was going to be like in his own experience to make it real for him. And so now it is very real for him, and he's in that place for, for, for some time now. We'll just see how long it goes, whether he has to do mushrooms again or not, but it was the trigger he needed to show him in his non-dual practice what it, meditation practice, what in fact the object was. And once he saw it, once the brain saw it, the brain said, that's it, we're going to do that. That's very cool answers from both of you. Thank you. Uh, Fareed says thank you to you both very much. I also wanted to thank Jake for the first question. I didn't get a chance to say that when we moved on to the second, but thank you. Um, we have more questions coming in here, so I'm just going to keep reading them out. Uh, Ivan asks, um, question, uh, how can self-inquiry or any other awakening practice be done effectively during the working day? Because my experience has been somewhat fruitless. It feels like there are too many triggers and distractions to effectively concentrate and see through the ego. Thanks. Yeah, well, during the day, the idea is if you read the uh, blog posts on Dialogues with Dominic, that's what Dominic really did very well. I mean, he did his practice at home, half an hour, 45 minutes, but he has a very uh, high-pressure, difficult, confrontational job, supervisory job. And that was the question. How does he put that into his practice day? And convinced him, and he learned, in fact, how to put that into his practice day, to where he would maybe every hour, maybe just serendipitously have his smartphone, give a smartphone app, it pops up and says, where am I or when am I or who is this? Something to remind you to just stop and take a look. And then that appears to have really enormous data value. I mean, it's a technical term because it does show that you're here and then that stops. And even if you only have a minute or two minutes to see that, the brain has the ability to see this extremely high contrast ratio. It's got quietness and extreme chaos. And so pick some external stimulus to trip you into go ahead and doing this. If you have to rely just upon yourself, you may not do it. So try to think of some external stimulus. Like every time you send a text or every time you walk down the hall or go to the bathroom, make a cup of tea, just stop, take a minute, ask yourself, whatever your question is, where am I, when am I, what is this, and just be there for a minute at the most. That's enough to give the brain a great piece of data. And it'll also break up your day. You may have been streaming along through your day, but it gives you a, just a quick break, stops that phenomena, and it gives your brain a sense of, ah, oh, we can do a better job in this. We can have a different way of being in our workplace, doing what we have to do. Boom, there it is. Yeah, Ivan, a, um, a really great resource that I found uh, useful and inspiring, and which I go back to over and over again, is uh, The Practice of the Presence of God by Pro Brother Lawrence, who was a... Uh, I think 17th century French monk, and it's just a series of letters. It's available uh, on audio on LibreVox, uh, and the text is available translated online. Um, and the reason he's instructive on this front is because he worked in a busy kitchen uh, in this monastery, and, he, and you know this very humble monk is constantly talking about how clumsy he is, and it's actually quite funny moments, but. Uh, he was able to focus his attention so that he said, you know, even when I'm just picking up a piece of straw from the ground, I'm doing it for God. Now, of course, 
Those are not the self-inquiry questions, but it's the same effect of focusing and being all in on the non-dual journey, right? And any kind of trigger that you can use in the world to remind you to focus your awareness to be in alliance, not with your, you know, temporary ego, but with where, whence that ego comes, you know, who am I? Um, so I really found Brother Lawrence very uh, uh, helpful in that because, you know, if he can do it in this kind of crowded, busy, noisy, chaotic kitchen, you know, really, I think I can do it while I'm on my bike or I'm driving a car or while I'm teaching or while I'm cooking dinner or I'm taking care of my kids or, you know, what, what have you. And the thing is, as I mentioned in one of the earlier episodes, if you start to practice it when things feel good, it makes it easier for the negative ones, right? So uh, as Gary was saying, choose a trigger and maybe choose a positive trigger, you know, that, you know, for every time, I don't know, depending on what your job is, you know, you get a good tip or you make a sale or somebody says a nice thing or, you know, a pretty girl or a handsome guy comes in who's having that experience right? That's your trigger. So by making the positive things your trigger, then it becomes, in my experience, more automatic. So then you can start doing it with the, when you're within the chaos and the negativity. That, that would be my sense. And it, it takes persistence, but it does come. It's, it's quite automatic. What do you say? Yeah, the brain eventually learns how to develop a called heuristic. I mean, the brain learns how to do these triggers. And if it's seeing an attractive person of the other sex, that can be a very powerful trigger because it will pull your attention out there. And you can use that positive experience, if it's a positive experience for you, to push you and say, okay, I'll turn now back inside. Yes. Who is it? What is it that has this attraction? What is feeling this emotion towards this form? It's a great pointer back. And it's something almost everybody goes through in the course of the day that can be a great reminder. And Islam has done this for a long time. You know, five times a day, they just stop and they do it. Get out the rug, they do their thing. And that's a great practice to do. But you can find all kinds of triggers. The ones which point out are excellent ones to push you during your day. Just to remind you, every time I see that, I will just stop, turn, look back inside. And then you start doing it, you know. Who hates their boss? <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know, so you start doing it with the negative moments. And the next thing you know, as you read in the posts about Dominic, you're at your job, but it's all autopilot. You're doing a better job because you're not getting caught up. If you follow the Dominic things, he, he has spent days in this high pressure. He's now his two kids. A high pressure job, confrontational, a lot of in your face stuff supervising people, and he can go days with almost no, virtually no thoughts. So you can do this. If he can do it, you can do it. Cool. Thank you for that. Yeah, Ivan uh, mentioned that when he does self, when he practices self-inquiry during the day with reminders, uh, there's still no stillness after asking it and no seeming effect, which makes me question if anything is happening. It's like, there, well, just the, the, what the question is: What kind of effect is is I been looking for? Because often people ask the question like, "Where am I?" And quickly the brain comes in, ego comes in, and fills in an answer to try to so, shut this thing down. If you just watch, there's a little tiny space there. If you've got the right question going on, where there is no, the brain can't come up with an answer fast enough. There's just a maybe be a little short space. But that is the answer. The answer is that there is, you say, where am I? And there's only this very brief, maybe, still space. That tells you something. There is something there. There is no answer to that. That is the answer. There is no I. There just isn't one. But you may have to tune yourself to right after the question to begin looking at for a little tiny space there that you might otherwise just slip right past as you run up into your brain and begin trying to find an intellectual answer to what is really an experiential question. And and also, as I said before, that that also suggests that maybe, Ivan, mean, you're you're not you know, make, taking your body to a place of stillness in order to feel 
the difference that the question can make. So maybe you want to focus on breath a little bit at that moment, for example, who's breathing? And if you really take the breath, that will almost kind of entrain you into a little bit of stillness so that you can feel the difference, right? I mean, you, you got it. It's kind of a chicken and egg problem here is that in order to feel the difference, you have to have a little bit of stillness. But in order to have a little bit of stillness, you have to have felt the difference. And that's where coming back to the breath and turning inside, just looking inside, feeling who am I, feeling who am I, not, not just asking, feeling who am I, you will get there. There's no question. I know it seems preposterous and a kind of ridiculous practice of asking yourself these questions, which you full well know who and where and when and how you are. Um, it will do that. Yeah, Rich has a great point. I mean, if you can't stop it with self-inquiry, then stop it with a practice. I mean, you can stop and do one of the classical things in Zen is to do breath counting. I mean, everybody does breath counting, almost everybody. In Zen, when they when they start out, some people do it for 40 years. It's a very simple thing. You just count your breath. I prefer counting exhales and count from one up to 10. Just very simple. Just stop and count the next 10 exhales and see if you can make it to 10. Often you can't make it all the way to 10. And so you just stop, do that practice, which can take a minute or two or three minutes. And that can be the what you do on these breaks. Just as Rich wisely said, just use your breath as your ally. But count your breaths from one up to ten, and then go back to one or ten again, and do it three times. And that's your practice. That's your break practice. If you can't get stuff in while you're stopping it, then just stop and do a very simple breath counting practice. Beautiful. Thank you so much. Uh, and Ivan says thank you to you both for your answers. Um, we're just going to keep going with uh, some some more questions here, and going to read one off from Corey. Corey asks, "I would love it if we talked about something from your latest blog post, Gary. The unwiring and the feelings that come up with." when letting go of eye attachments and how they can sometimes be unsettling. This post was extremely helpful so far with people that I know ha uh, who are doing inquiry. Uh, it would be nice if we expanded on that topic a bit. I've had intense body reactions slash grief over loss of self with subsequent release of course. They led to more peace. However, as they were happening, there was confusion. Yeah, well, it's the blog post that went up yesterday the idea was uh, how the changing brain uh, cha turns our pleasures into addiction. And the idea was in the blog post to go through and look at the latest science we have on this thing, that the brain does, I mean, evolutionarily, Darwinianly, did evolve the ability to uh, chemically sustain the network that was coupled to these pleasures. And it found a way to do that, something called FOSB, which is talked about in the blog post. And this really kind of cements those neural networks together around certain pleasures, whether it's sex, drugs, or rock and roll. I mean, it cements those in. You say, well, why would the brain do this? Well, it would seem to make sense evolutionarily, Darwinianly, to code in a network and fasten it in, stick it in place that supported having sex. So we get reproduce, reproduction, more children, you have to get out. Or getting food or running because you have to run after things on the build to try to catch a, you know, some kind of an animal, take it back to eat. So a lot of the, the behaviors that we're looking at now, even the ones that we talk about social media in the blog post, I mean, there's so many people now who are addicted, not just figuratively, but they're actually are addicted to social media because it gives them a shot of dopamine Every time they get a tweet or every time they like on Facebook, they get a little shot of dopamine. You say, well, why would the brain encode something like that? But it was very important way back when to fit into the hierarchy. Once we came off the veil running along, running along by ourselves, two or three or four of us, into a big complex hierarchical structure, it was critical that I fit into that structure somehow. So if I'm communicating with others, I'm socially interacting, I'm forging hierarchical links in that structure. So I will fit in. If you didn't fit in, 
for a long, long time to your hierarchical structure, you perish. They just threw you out of the out of the tribe, out of the cave. Well, they burned you. And, and they burned you, and you, and you die. And so that's why you know the social interaction, social media is so compelling because we are evolved to make sure that we do communicate with others and get them to like us, find out if we don't like them, if they don't like us, what are we doing wrong? We have a huge amount of real estate up here coded into processing. Does she like me? Does she not like me? If she's the alpha female and I've really you know, antagonized her some way, I'm probably going to die. And so we just learned how to do that, which is why we're so addicted so quickly to social media. Seems like all of those pleasures that we have, we have somehow Darwinianly found those to be useful to support them and to have them stick around for a long time. As I talked about in the blog post, I mean, for me, with my meditation, I just found out, I used to run a lot and get runner's highs, that I would just, I would just sit until I got a runner's high. I found I could do it after like 35 or 40 minutes. And so I just sat every time until I got a runner's high, and then eventually became addicted because it supported, you know, this same phenomenon over and over and over again. So my meditation became an addictive process in a, in a very good way, in my humble opinion. So I would encourage people to, to look at their behaviors and see what they're doing that, you know, they might say, well, I've got this pleasure. Am I feeding a, an undesirable behavior? Am I spending four hours a day on Facebook, six hours a day on Facebook, four hours a day on YouTube? Am I spending six hours a day texting? Do I text 150 times a day? Because you will, you will become more and more addicted to that behavior because that's how the system is set up. That's how we are evolved to make this thing take place. And unless you take some conscious action to remove that stimulus away from you to some other more desirable pleasure, you're going to get caught running down these paths. And many of us are addicted to social media. And we've got us, you know, we don't have to. It's a great drug delivery device. You can sit there and get 160 shots of dopamine a day or more. Unless you find some way to pull yourself out of that, do something also pleasurable to displace that with a better, sweeter pleasure. I wanted to uh, respond also to this idea of the, the grief at no self, Corey. Um, and um, one, one thing you might find resonant is that uh, for me, and it sounds like for you and, and, and some of the people that you were talking to, that it gets, there's periods where it gets curiouser and curiouser, you know, Pace Lewis Carroll, that, uh, that as we unwind the self, uh, it can seem kind of freaky, uh, upsetting, um, and the coming into contact with the fact of no self can very much, as you put it, cause this state of grief. Um, what I have found really useful uh, in that way, which I didn't even realize while I was doing it, is um, reading kind of in the history of spiritual autobiography of other people who have gone through this, because it's somehow reassuring to see that this is actually a symptom of the journey and not some special private hell or punishment that has been, re that has been reserved for you, but is in fact an ordinary sense of the journey allows you to have that little bit of space where you say, well, who's worried about not having the self? Who, who misses the self? Who's in grief about the self? So right now I'm teaching Augustine's Confessions, and it's astonishing because, you know, here you have an architect of the early Christian church, and it is clearly a journey to the self where he's systematically looking at what he thinks is his self, his self and then sees that it is not, sees that it has in fact been grace, has been God. And that systematic kind of unwinding of himself is not pleasant for him. But sort of seeing his trials and tribulations, I think, and you know, many others, you know, more contemporary versions of uh, things like a book called um, Collision uh, with the Infinite by um, Suzanne Susan Seagal. Seagal, right. Um, you know, looking at uh, Ramana Maharshi's Who Am I? Um, looking at these other 
you know, tales of how one has come into awakening can help contextualize this grief so that you can see that it's not you. You know, this is just the process releasing, as you pointed out, um, the attachments. And as the attachments are released, you know, there's that kind of farewell party <laughs> that the ego throws for itself. And, you know, and it's, it's not always pleasant, but, you know, this too self shall pass. Well, and we were on Facebook yesterday, but, but uh, one of the people came up with the idea that the I is the ultimate addiction. I yeah. mean, the I, you, the I is mm-hmm. an addiction that we have learned our way into. We believe we've derived pleasure from this I. And the question before the house, we begin self-inquiry is, is this, is this addiction useful? I mean, we Darwinianly encoded this I for about 60, 70,000 years. Is it useful anymore? And you can begin to question it, like you question social media. I'm not picking on social media, but any addiction, just say, is this a useful addiction for me? And so as you begin to unwind the ultimate addiction, which is this I, it's not surprising that lots, billions probably, of, of uh, interconnections in your neural, neural networks that are related to this I. And they all aren't going to unzip at once, thank God. You know, they're going to unzip a few at a time. And you're going to go through periods, as we talked about in blog posts, where there'll be nothing. And all of a sudden, something will pop up from 20 years ago. You didn't even realize you even still had a memory of. But it was a big fear. It pops up again. You don't take delivery on it. as talk much about the blog post. And it just goes away. Whether you're grieving for a loved one that passed away or left you, or you're looking at the through the eye, you're grieving for something important that you've had a big attachment to in the past, an addiction to. And so you're going to have this deconstruction as the brain goes around. We talked about the metaphor tearing down old buildings that aren't being used anymore and repurposing the real estate for something else. This is a chaotic process as far as you know the brain's going through, tearing down buildings and building new buildings. You're going to have some unpleasant periods with that. But you can also, when you let go, when those buildings come tumbling down, almost everybody gets a little hit of dopamine, a good feel of it. Yes, you relieved this knot. It was someplace locked up in one's neural network that had stored a very bad memory from the past, and you've let go of it. It's no longer useful. It's no longer serving you any value at all. So you just let go of it. And amazingly, fortunately, just by saying, I'm going to let go of this, I'm not taking delivery on that package, it just goes away. The brain says, fine with us. You don't like it? It's out of here. We're tearing that building down. Thank you very much. Uh, Corey just wrote, thank you, Rich and Gary. The insight with the I being the ultimate addiction is what I was looking for. It is exactly that psychic withdrawal pains, which naturally must happen when letting go. So thank you for answering, and thank you for your question for the question, Corey. It was really a great one. Um, more questions coming in, so I'm just going to keep rolling with them. Uh, Matthew asks, "I would like some more practical practical input on how to integrate this letting go of attachment practice, i.e., Byron Katie Sedona method, in my efforts towards non-dual awakening." Would I sit down every night and go through this process in regards to something I'm hung up on? Should I keep using the same hang-up attachment until it's gone? Or should I use whatever was the main attachment bothering me that day? What does it feel like to let go of an attachment? Is it the same? Is it the kind of thing where one just no longer cares about what was once bothering you? I personally have a lot of doubt about whether questioning an attachment can really cause these deep-seated issues to just resolve themselves. Thanks. Yes, so a good um, protocol to use if you go to the YouTube's videos we have and look at Shut Up and Chant, uh, Rich and I chant, something we chant a lot, which is Nirvana Shatikam, which is Shankara, who was the codifier of non-duality back about the 8th century ACE. And he wrote down all of the attachments, the classes of attachments that he had. And many people have found it very useful to go in through those Nirmanashati comments, also in the back of a Happiness Beyond Thought. And as the chanting, we've actually annotated the words in English so you can see, see those as we chant them through. 
and just begin to look at each one of those. It starts out, Mano Bhuja Hanka Vichitani Naham, which is, you know, I have four different aspects of my mind. Mano is my, you know, lower mind, my emotional mind. Buddhi is my intellectual mind. Chitane, I've got memories. And Ahankara is my ego, my I. And so you look at each one of those and say, am I attached to my intellectual mind? If you're an intellectual, then you have almost certainly a deep attachment to your identity as an intellectual and the power that that has brought to you. And you look at that and you say, am I attached to that? And you can feel the attachment to that. If you can't do that, and then there's other ones later on about being attached to your family or your friends, or your mother or your father or your teacher or your students. Pick one of those that really has a strong grab on you and just say, am I attached to my dog, to my cat? How do I feel about my dog? What if my dog were not here anymore? Could I let go of my attachment to my dog? Which isn't the same thing as putting the poor thing out in the snow. It's just saying, okay, what if the dog weren't here? How would I feel? You can feel how you are attached to your dog or your kids or your cat or your car or your job or your stock options, whatever it is, you're, are you attached to those? What if they weren't there? Can you feel how it would feel to have them and then not have them? And if you can get that feeling in yourself, again, we're going into, into feeling context, not intellectual, it's a, amazing that you can feel a release as you let go of each one of the patterns. You can feel the resistance. You can feel you're holding on. And before you engage that, say it's a car, before you engage that car in your consciousness, you feel one way. You engage the car in your consciousness, you feel another way. And you can feel between those two how the difference is. That difference is your attachment. And you can, if you grab hold of that attachment feeling, you can just let go of it, Sedona method-wise and Byron Katie-wise. As you let go of that, you find that, in fact, it does lose its potency. If it's a problematic thought you're having or attachment you've got or some current major storyline, work with that, as you mentioned. It's right there in front of you. Feel how you feel when you don't have it. Feel how you feel when you have it. You can get rid of it. Amazingly, fortunately, you can just say, I let go of this thing, so don't know why it's now, and it will go away. And, and Matthew, towards the end, you said you had serious doubts um, that um, simply by working with these attachments, they can disappear. But if we return to the previous discussion about the I being the ultimate addiction, uh, it may help to see that it makes perfect sense that in some sense, the I is nothing but a cluster of these attachments, right? So uh, if we, um, the same principle that applies when we say, who am I, when am I, and Guess what? We search and search and search, and we don't find that entity. And over time, the brain becomes convinced that there isn't one there. Um, that the same thing can happen attachment by attachment, saying, you know, is this really true that, um, I don't know, I need to have this feeling of being attracted to this person, right? Do I need that? Do I really? need to have this relationship to say marijuana and when i be with that right when i'm with that the same kind of search for where that need would be <laughs> takes place as when we're doing atman vichara the, the question of self-inquiry and it doesn't find anywhere where that need for marijuana or that need for approval could be and so Step by step, as the attachments bother us, right? So if I need to smoke marijuana every day and that starts to bother me, as we step by step work with those attachments, then this attachment falls away, this attachment falls away. And like, you know what? You get pretty good at it, actually. <laughs> it's like, hey, as Gary pointed out, you get this dopamine hit when, that, when an attachment is released. So a feedback loop starts to happen. And it's like, oh, well, maybe there's some attachments in here I can let go of. Oh, yummy, yummy, yummy. I don't want sugar now, or I don't, you know. So uh, I think that if you see that, A, the eye is nothing but these attachments, B, the eye doesn't reside anywhere, so if we search for it, we won't find it, and C, if we search for where the attachments would attach, we can't find it, then they will start to dissipate, 
And it only takes one or two for you to experience that. So I would encourage you to, um, you know, feel the intensity of those doubts and really test that doubt against the practice of working with attachments. And, you, and you'll see that they will dissipate. That it really is that simple. Something else, Matthew, is um, the ego's master of coming up to a very cunning adversary with questions to try to stop this process. And this whole thing of I'm skeptical about this. Well, who is skeptical yes. about this? Feel your way back into what this skeptical thing is. What is this skeptical entity? It has a feeling to it. See if you can feel what skepticism feels like. It has a certain taste to it. And then ask yourself, what is this skeptics? What is this skeptic thing that's sitting there asking this question? What is its problem? What is it worried about? What is this skeptic afraid of? There's almost always a fear there of some kind. Don't, I'm not going to lose my job here as CEO of Michael and Company. Uh, what am I? Who, who is that? What is this skeptical entity that's asking these questions? What does it have in the game? But do it feeling like text, you know, get a sense of the energy of it. And you can let go of it and you'll see what happens. Thank you so much. Uh, Matthew says, thanks, Gary and Rich. Feeling this attachment process in the same way do with the inquiry question sounds very useful. I will. I appreciate it. So thankful for your answers. Um, more questions coming in. Uh, some great questions here. One that kind of piggybacks off of, Rich, what you were just talking about using the example of marijuana. Uh, Benjamin asks, just wondering if there are any comments on the use of marijuana or microdosing for non-dual awakening. Um, cannabis is a great teacher. There's no question about it. Um, a uh, powerful medicine. Um, I think it's a medicine that we do not, in this culture, tend to really respect properly, to be honest with you. I don't think we really know most of us, what cannabis is. Um, and so, therefore, uh, I would say that bundled with a meditation practice that really explores what exactly cannabis is and explores what those states of consciousness are uh, can be very valuable. Just as we were mentioning before about the conjunction of psilocybin use with long-term meditation and self-inquiry, these things can work together. Um, I do think that um, cannabis can be very helpful uh, on this journey. Um, I would say uh, that part of the cultural challenge that we have is that we put, because we put cannabis in a different category than psychedelics or uh, uh, such as psilocybin or LSD or ayahuasca, I think that we tend to undervalue the nature of it as a teacher. Um, so I think that first and foremost, if we're going to work with cannabis, we need to really rethink what it is that we think it is. Like not as a recreational drug, not as something uh, with which we simply get high, even though both of those things are perfectly valid aspects of the cannabis experience but really work deliberately to cultivate, uh, as it were, our treatment of cannabis as a sacrament, as a practice, as something that we are using as a way of learning about what we are and what our brain is. Uh, if we do that, then I think cannabis is a beautiful non-dual uh, and spiritual tool. Uh, on the other hand, because it tends to be a more gentle teacher than, say, the sternness of ayahuasca at times, um, or even uh, psilocybin, uh, that it is precisely easy to take it for granted and not see it as a teacher and not focus our awareness on what it is we're being taught by this planet with which we have co-evolved. So I think as long as we're willing to take very seriously uh, our need to uh, unknow what it is we think cannabis is and unknow whatever it is we think that we're going to microdose with, then I think that these things can be useful tools. However, 
The tool is not the destination, right? If we become addicted, as it were, to the use of these tools, then unlike meditation, which opens us up to releasing the attachments, it is my experience for many people that, for example, cannabis and other uh, um, you know, pharmacological agents or plant agents can become, in their, their own right, attachments that must be overcome and released. That doesn't mean they have to. That doesn't mean there's something essentially um, more oriented towards attachment in them. But in our culture that has this category called drugs, we are prone to that. So that would be my, uh, you know, overly long response to that. But the beautiful plant, cannabis, uh, I don't know which agents you're talking about microdosing with, but um, I know that psilocybin uh, at lower doses can be very helpful for people uh, as well as at higher doses. Gary, do you have anything you'd like to add to that or? I, I, I'm, you have no value whatsoever. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, thank you very much. And Benjamin says, thank you. That was very insightful. So thank you, Rich. And uh, pass from Gary. So um, I'm going to uh, go to the next question here, which is a really awesome one, I think, uh, to pose to you both from Gail. What is the relationship with brain and ego? <laughs> well, we, we've, we've coded in this, um, the ultimate addiction of this I ego um, 75,000 or so years ago, because we thought it offered us some evolutionary advantage. I mean, it is now a um, program that the brain has learned how to use and we've passed on down behaviorally uh, amongst our species. In fact, and everybody has one. Our language encodes it. I mean, there's the subject, object, verb is so much a part of the human language. Um, almost every language has that in it someplace. There are very few non-subject, object, verb languages. So you have an, a subject continuously reinforced in the course of your day. Internally, uh, on your self-referential internal narrative, it goes on in most people's minds, and who you talk to, 10, 12, 15,000 thoughts a day. We have this never-ending repetition of, you know, talking to yourself, by yourself, of yourself, about yourself, for yourself, against yourself, goes on endlessly. So we've reinforced that. We found use out of it, we believe, to put the language in place so we could share labors. We could partition off functionalities. You will do this. All right. And I will do that. Okay. <laughs> and, and that's my wife. Hmm. And that's your wife. Check. Uh, whatever. But, you know, we, we found a way to get something out of that. But now, arguably, we've made it too powerful. It's really taken over the whole game. And we're just now looking. Self-inquiry is a very elegant way that people come up with. And they've done it. They discovered it across the ages. But Ramon Maharshi is the most contemporary person who's really put it into practice. Uh, that is very quick and powerful. I mean, Ajishanti has been said the only problem with non-duality is that it's too simple, it's too logical, it's too straightforward, it's such an obvious thing to look at. We have this I existing continuously. Is it real? How is it built? And if we ask a question like, where am I, and look at it neuroscientifically, an fMRI or something, we see that the I is all over the place. Not only is there no eye when you ask it for yourself experientially, when you look at where the eye manifests in the brain, it's all over the place. There's no one place that the eye sits there and decides anything. It's just a passing ad hoc functionality in different parts of the brain. You can watch the waves sweep across the brain and activate different elements of this ad hoc eye. But there is no eye anyplace. This is just a phantom that we've constructed, and as we've shown, you can deconstruct it. If it weren't deconstructible, we couldn't have deconstructed it. So it's not that hard to do. You just begin asking if it's real or not. And it turns out the brain recognizes this is a not useful algorithm, and it stops using it. And, uh, you know, what's beautiful is, is that when you start deconstructing the eye, you start to see that you had previously been uh, confusing the brain 
with the eye. And in fact, the brain is doing all kinds of amazing stuff. And you're running it all through this nozzle <laughs> that you call the eye that has to kind of have this pretense to being located in space and time. And when in fact, there's all this kind of like lightning fast parallel processing going on in your brain and ideation and creativity that, you know, if it somehow, you know, can make it through that ego nozzle, then you squeeze off an idea at the end of it and you say, thank you very much. But as you start to relax and wither that ahankara, that egoic part of the brain, the brain seems to be really happy about it. <laughs> the brain seems to really, it's kind of, you know, tantric brain activity. The brain just sort of goes, woohoo, you know, uh, the, you know, no more like Debbie Downer bringing us down here. You know, there's no more nozzle trying to constrict this uh, 50 trillion, 100 trillion neuronal interconnection thing going on with this tiny little party over here calling itself the eye. So it's really quite like ecstatic to feel the difference between the brain and the ego, where the ego is just one attribute of the brain that the brain has come up with evolutionarily, as Gary is saying, you know, for very concrete purposes in our evolutionary past, but which now, you know, it's really pretty clear that uh, we it's out, you know, we've outlived its usefulness. Yeah, key point, and this is in many blog posts and some talks of mine, that uh, I, the, the metaphor of an elephant and a rider. I mean, you look at a little tiny mahout on top of a big elephant, uh, and that's kind of what we have with this eye versus the brain. As Rich was saying, I mean, the, we we cut this little press secretary sitting up on top of this huge, massive parallel processor with, you know, the wonder of the universe, literally. And we can do it in this little space up here. We can do seven plus or minus two things at a time. We can hold them. And we can solve one problem at a time. Underneath that, we have 100 billion neurons and 50, 75, 100 trillion synaptic interconnections running everything, digesting our food, making our heart beat, walking up and down the stairs. If the eye had to come in and actually think how to walk up the stairs, you would be standing there the rest of your life. You don't have any idea how to move your legs how the bones and muscles and sinews work, how the neurochemistry works, how the motor cortex works. You don't have a clue. We go through our days believing that somehow, you know, we make this day happen. And you watch any, this most simple motor function that you've got like this. You could, if you never could do that, if you had to think about how you did this before you did it, you would never turn your hand. I mean, the eye is just a press secretary that takes credit for the good things. And if something goes wrong, runs around blaming everybody else, whoever everybody else is, for not getting it right. I mean, it's, it's just ridiculous how tiny it is and how huge the parallel process that does all the work is. It's just a completely disproportionate uh, taking credit for something that's not there. Yes, many of us have had this experience of, you know, having a boss that is sort of like out of the TV show The Office, you know, like it's like, why do they have that job? They're taking all of the credit for everything. They don't do anything. In fact, if that boss weren't there, we could get so much more done. And that's really like who the eye is. Say, I'm I'm in control here. It's like, oh yeah, well, what are you doing with the oxygenation levels in your in your blood? It's like, um, um, um whose job is that? Um, you know, so you know, it seems like it's in control, but it really is just that rider on the elephant, as Gary's saying. It's very funny when you when you catch it out. That's great. <laughs> I love the uh, connection to the, the show The Office. That's really funny. Um, uh, yes, uh, more questions coming in, so we're just going to keep rolling with it. Um, uh, Michael asks, uh, I'm curious about the relationship of the triune brain as it relates to the quieting, the blah, 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 physical, emotional self-narrative. Help me on the triune brain. It's a... Uh, old evolutionary concept. Well, not old, it's from the 60s. Uh, Dr. McLean, uh, about the reptilian brain evolution. Yeah. Oh, 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 
And what's the question then? Just ask it again, please. Uh, sure, I'll read it again. Uh, I'm curious about the relationship of the triune brain as it relates to the to quieting the blah, 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 physical, emotional self-narrative. Well, it, most of the self-referential internal narratives we found out, we demonstrated in the Yale study with fMRI for 10,000 hour plus or minus meditators is that there are uh, 11 centers that constitute most of what we call self in. This I mean mind that goes on all day long. And in that 11 member network, there are two side networks. One network does me through time, the sense of me through time, and one does me and others, self and others. And we found out that with psilocybin or with bundle meditation uh, or tasking, we can shut down the two key nodes in that neural network. And we can at the same time lose this sense of self and other, which is the psychedelic experience or the uh, mystical experience of everything is one thing. We're all one. The other side shuts down the me through time, me with the past, me with the future, and when that stops, there's only now. And so you have the common mystical experience of now, now, now. There is no past and future. So that selfing network is what really does the uh, blah, blah network shutting down. If you can, uh, we can do it in the Yale fMRI. Now there's an EEG rig that's at the University of Massachusetts at Worcester that uh, will do the same thing. You can actually watch, you show, you shut down those two key nodes in that default mode network, and as you do, blah, blah is not there. If you can see yourself go back into activating those centers, it's back again. Blah, blah starts all over again. You can lie there in the fMRI, sit there at the EEG, and you can watch yourself go in and out of selfing, in and out of blah, blah. So we, we know some excellent research done, Harvard, MIT, on scoping out that default mode network, how many centers there are, how they're connected, what they're connected to, who tells them what to do, who shuts them down, who starts them again. We know that science pretty, pretty well. So we've got that pretty much worked out. But the other part of the triune brain, the lower parts, uh, they have to operate automatically. I mean, many of those things are or live or die, fight or flight. And they have to operate so quickly that there's no time to engage the I, me, my reasoning, thinking about the legend, discussing with ourselves, or the lion eats us. So they just happen much more quickly. They're wired in that way. They, so they started first because they're most important for our survival. We now have this great reasoning capacity, which is the wonder of the universe. Great, thank you for that and thank you for the question Michael um, some great questions coming in uh, Michael uh, also wanted to make a comment uh, further comment about St. Francis of Assisi quote what you're looking for is what's doing the looking Ooh. and he said I first heard this quote in a more psychological context as what you're looking for is what you're looking with the mm -hmm. original quote addresses the knowing awareness looking or from St. Francis' perspective, God doing the looking. The other quote is the separate self looking on the spiritual path with the cultural conditioning slash programming, looking for an answer or solution or escape from the suffering. I thought that was a pretty beautiful breakdown of that, those mm -hmm. quotes. Yeah, one, um, one of the really uh, great experiences was I was in Assisi and actually saw his robe. I mean, if you want to see a real example of spiritual humility and sacrifice and being present, I mean, you look at his robe and his sandals. It's amazing, you know, what he did with the space that he had and the space in which he operated. There was an earlier question, too, if I just go back to it. On, and Rich talked about people who've been through spiritual suffering. Um, a, a good uh, example is I was staying at an ashram on the south shores of the uh, Calgary River in South India. And there was a uh, fusion, Hindu uh, Catholic monastic fusion attempt there where some French Catholic monastics came down and were going to try to, you know, convert the Hindu and Hindu mystics into Catholic mysticism or Catholicism, period. And it didn't go that way. But there were two key people that made this thing take place in the 40s, 30s and 40s, into the late 40s. Um, 
this ashram was called Shantivan, I and mean, there were two key people, one of which was named Abhishek Dananda. And what he did was he actually ran to Ramana Maharshi. And when he did, then he came into self-inquiry, he completely opened up, he stopped being a Catholic monastic mystic and became you know, completely a, a non-dual person. But he did, to Rich's earlier point, he did struggle his entire life with trying to reconcile his, basically the Eucharist, with what he had found out from a non-dual perspective. And he wrote some of the most poignant, for me, uh, spiritual literature on just how he struggled with trying to reconcile the Eucharist with his non-duality that he'd experienced. Mother Teresa also, if you read her, her letters, um, I think it's Come Be My, Come Be My Guide, I think it is. But um, if you read her letters, she went through the same kind of struggle. Uh, she actually wrote down and said, oh, don't tell anybody else what I'm writing about. Burn these letters when you get them. Uh, destroy them. They didn't. And for you know, all credit to somebody, they put them together into a book. And you can read about how she came into an understanding of non-duality, kind of against her will. It just happened. And but she had cherished her love relationship with Christ. I mean, she had this not this dual experience with Christ. And she didn't like losing it. This was a big unhappiness to her. And it went on for the, most of the last 20 years of her life. And she really went through extreme agony over that. So to Rich's point, I mean, Mother Teresa did it. And this other fellow, Abhishek Dananda, and whose hut I was fortunate enough to stay in while I was in India, um, went through this and did a wonderful job of documenting the struggle, especially in Christianity, between having Christ out there and loving that process and relationship, and then having a non-dual experience where the other disappeared, went away. That's beautiful. Thank you for sharing that with us. Uh, wow, um, I, have, I think we have time for maybe one more question, and um, this one seems just super great to, to go to at this point. So, I mean, they've all been great, and I want to thank Michael for his question and comment, and Gail before that for, for great questions. Uh, so, Ivan has one here. Um, why do you think the success rate of awakening has been so, so slow historically if this stillness is our natural state? Lack of information on awakening or just lack of dedication? The ego seems like the master hypnotist. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a great, great question. Um, I think a lot of it in the past was it was not good communication. But, but to back up, Rich and I chant the Gita. Uh, and in the Gita, there are three verses that talk about low probability. I mean, one of the verses is, Mom, or something. That we won't do it. <laughs> that we, we won't people chant. But the one verse goes through and says basically one out of a thousand will actually seek to find me. And of those, maybe only one out of a thousand of those will actually enter this place of non-duality. So it's one out of a million, and that goes back 2,500 years ago. So it was low statistically back then, it's kind of low statistically now. And we're trying to find some way to make that not be such a low probability event. And I, I hope, believe, that if we can get better communication like we're trying to do, get the word out that it's possible. I think a lot of people didn't know it was possible. I didn't know it was possible until I came across your Mana Maharshi stuff. Know that it's possible. We now have good, hard science behind this thing. We have lots of data coming in. A lot of people are trying this thing. I don't think it's gonna take over like mindfulness has. Maybe it will, but we're getting better communication. Statistics were very poor. There weren't many people around who had the experience, who understood it. And now we have vehicles to spread that information. So hopefully, who knows, uh, it'll be what it is, but that can be a catalyst for more people coming into this beautiful, sweet, incredible space. Um, I also think to uh, concur with what Gary's saying there, uh, that it's kind of been hidden in plain sight. You know, there's the uh, Edgar Allan Poe's story, the Pergolene letter, where they're, they're, they're looking for this, letter that's been hidden away. And in fact, it's just crumbled up in a piece of paper uh, right in the person's room. And so they look right past it. And I think the St. Francis line that you quoted earlier of, of seek the seeker, 
I think Rumi said basically the same thing is that it, it, it makes a certain amount of kind of sense that we've been enthralled to kind of like, where is it? Where is it? It's got to be out here somewhere. You know, is it there? Is this it? Is the Lamborghini it? Is the bomb it? Is my iPhone it? Right. You know, whatever. And never, you know, thinking to just turn around and look at who the seeker is because it's so obvious. I mean, that's the paradox. That's what puts Ajay Shanti's uh, comments into some context. It's so simple that nobody sees it. Um, but I think, as Gary points out, as we start to have this capacity to um, communicate it, and uh, as we work out, you know, kind of systematically deconstruct some of the reasons why we might try to come up with ways of avoiding it, right? So when we see that it makes good scientific sense, when we see that it is compatible with the esoteric uh, aspects of each one of, of all of the global spiritual traditions, when we see that, you know, it's possible to be a Christian, to be a Buddhist, to be Hindu, to be Muslim, uh, to be secular, to be an atheist and practice this way, then I, I do think uh, that it is likely to become contagious. And I think that the proliferation of uh, um, means associated with mindfulness is likely to be a precursor uh, to that. And that, um, so it may be that evolute, that we're evolving in this way as we always have, just as we need to, <laughs> just in the nick of time as it were. Um, so that's the way it feels, you know, from over here. But I, but I just wanted to return to the idea, the purloined letter, that it's just, it's because it's right there. We don't see it. We can't possibly be interested in that. You know, we just take it for granted, this ongoing questing nature of the eye. And we never turn around and see, hey, who's looking for it? And if we look at who's looking for it, then we can't not find it.